So now we have a paradox. How it is possible that sick people who breathe very heavy, they have little oxygen inside their body. Whereas healthy people who breathe little have much more oxygen. In order to understand this paradox, let us consider oxygen transport. When we take inhale, this volume of air is spread over our lungs. Our lung size is incredible. It's about half size of the tennis court. And it's spread in very, very thin layer. So you can imagine there is very efficient oxygen exchange between gas in our lungs and blood. Our blood, after this process, is about 98% saturated with oxygen. Almost completely. So by heavy breathing, we can't get much more. But there is one gas that we remove during breathing. This gas is CO2, carbon dioxide. Now when people think about CO2, what is it? Do we need it? Most ordinary people tell that CO2 is toxic waste, poisonous gas. I spoke with hundreds, thousands of people during lectures with just ordinary conversations. And I found that people believe that CO2 is not necessary for our health. Whereas medical people have totally opposite opinion. They know that if CO2 drops in our body about four times below the norm, below the medical norm, we are going to die in minutes. Heavy, big, deep breathing is good for health. Medical people, when they ask how should we breathe at rest, they give the opposite answer. They tell we have to breathe very little. And medical people are absolutely right, because CO2 is exceptionally important for our health. Why? Consider the following experiment. What is going to happen with a person who tries to do 100 fast and big breath in succession? <laughs> Heavy breathing for about one minute. The person is going to pass out, to faint. Why? Because of lack of oxygen in the brain. Let us look at the results of this experiment. This is a typical study. There are many other studies with totally the same result. Here is we have normal breathing. This is the oxygen content in our brain. It is given here in colors. We have violet colors, blue colors which indicate low oxygenation. And on the right side we have yellow and red in rainbow. And this yellow and red colors indicate high oxygenation. Now, after one minute of hyperventilation, this is what go going on with our brain. In the study, they found 40% reduction in oxygen availability just after one minute of hyperventilation. But if a sick person breathes not that heavy, but let's say 50, not 25 liters per minute, of course, he would be somewhere in between. He would be already deficient in oxygen inside the brain. Now, why does it take place? And in order to understand that, we have to understand another thing. CO2 is exceptionally important for dilation of blood vessels. Our smooth blood vessels, arteries and arterioles, they have muscular layers around them. And what happens when CO2 is normal, they are dilated, they are white. And when we hyperventilate, they get constricted. So here we write vasoconstrictive effects, meaning that low level of CO2, they call it hypocapnia, Carbon dioxide deficiency. This is the main cause. So because of that, let us write the property of CO2. CO2. And property number one is vasodilator. So when we hyperventilate, our blood vessels constrict and blood supply to the brain is less than it should be. Now there are many studies done probably up to 50, 70 years ago, that found if we have mild hyperventilation, as many sick people have, then reduction in oxygen availability and blood supply can be put on the line. So just we breathe a little bit heavy and then we have less blood supply, less perfusion of the brain and less oxygen supply. Let us look at the quote which was given by Professor Newton from California, what he said about this effect. Cerebral blood flow decreases 2% for every millimeter mercury decrease in CO2. Professor Newton, University of Southern California Medical Center, Hyperventilation Syndrome, 2004. I made some calculations and found that it's easy to find out how much is the blood supply for a person depending on breath holding time. In norm, according to physiological standards, we should have about 40 seconds breath holding time and then we have normal blood supply. But when breath holding time is less, correspondingly blood supply is going to be less. 
For example, a person with 20 seconds breath holding time would have 20% less oxygen in the brain. The person who has 10 seconds breath holding time is going to be 30% less oxygen. Now, those who have almost zero have 40, as this result indicates. There is one practical test how we can find that this effect, vasodilation, is real effect. Imagine a situation in life. We get a small cut. What would happen with that person? The person would see on blood and would feel pain. Now, these two effects, of course, would produce a little bit heavy breathing. The breathing becomes heavy, blood vessels constrict, blood losses are going to be smaller. Now, the next time, if you can get a small cut, you can do the opposite thing. You can hold the breath, the same as we did during breath holding time test. What would ha happen? You would notice that blood flow can be two, three, four times stronger just because holding our breath. Why? Because when we hold our breath, we accumulate CO2. And CO2 delays blood vessels. So blood flow, blood losses are going to be stronger. We now can also make a connection with evolution. It's probably very useful from evolutionary viewpoint. Because primitive people in the past, they had various situations, they could get cuts, they could get bruises, so the bleeding is present. And then, of course, if we have vasoconstrictive effects, blood losses would be lost, would be less. And that would help us to survive in wild conditions. There are also other studies, not only, only on the brain, which confirmed that vasodilation is factor, for example, for kidneys, liver, heart and other vital organs. The heavier we breathe, generally, the less blood supply or perfusion of these vital organs.